um, and welcome to our first workshop of our Teacher Garden Club. Um, so today we're going to be talking about how to prepare for your classroom garden, and we have Cheryl with us who's going to be speaking. Um, Cheryl is an author and a master gardener. She holds a Prairie Horticultural Certificate and a Sustainable Urban Agriculture Certificate. She's an established gardening writer and has hundreds of published articles. Um, Cheryl is going to give us a quick presentation and then we're going to have a, a question and answer session afterwards. So if you do have any questions, you can save them till the end and we'll have a chance to go through those. Um, so Cheryl, if you want to go ahead. Perfect. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, thanks to Agriculture for Life for giving me the opportunity to speak to all of you today. It's great to see you here. Um, <laughs> it's snowing like mad in Calgary, so <laughs> it's a great day to talk about seed starting and getting things going in your classroom. So. Um, I'm actually a small space gardener. Um, I have a balcony garden and plots in a community garden. So even though I have a tiny apartment, I start seeds every year in March. Um, I grow them under lights um, in my kitchen. Um, so I do mostly tomatoes. I do um, onions, annual flowers, um, herbs, whatever I can cram into my little small space. Um, I find that growing from seed is so exciting. There's that thrill of seeing that little tiny chunk sprout into something that a beautiful living organism it just never gets old. So um, I think that's the way that children of all ages react to growing plants from seeds. So I think it's a really great opportunity to be able to do these things in your classroom. Um, so I'm going to cover a few topics in this talk, including a few reasons why we sow seeds indoors, um, types of plants that are great to grow indoors in the classroom, some educational concepts that you can link to growing plants in the classroom. Um, prepping for growing seeds in the classroom, um, these include things like choosing containers, um, selecting potting media, any extra tools, accessories that you need, that you might want. Um, I'm going to talk about understanding the information on seed packages um, and uh, things like sunlight, what your requirements are, watering, um, seed sowing, of course, that's the most important thing, and then troubleshooting. Um, just some little things that happen right when your seeds just start to come up. So I'm not going to go any farther than that because the next talk on April 7th is going to address that kind of thing. So yeah. Um, so let's get started. The reasons why we grow seeds indoors. Um, so for the most part, a lot of us, um, if we're not growing seeds indoors to grow the plants to full maturity indoors. So say you have some microgreens or something like that um, where you're growing the plants to your baby green stage or maybe you're growing lettuce to baby stage um, you know those kinds of things or you're growing radishes you can actually bring them to full you know to you get a full, full size root off of them indoors um, lots and lots of plants you can do that with if you're not doing that you're probably growing you're probably starting seeds so that you can transplant them outdoors later in the spring um, so that's one of the big reasons um, we, uh, some plants take a really long time to get going uh, depending on their, their days to maturity. And we have a short gardening season, growing season in, in Alberta. So, uh, you know, Calgary, I think our frost free days are what, 117 or something like that now. So 117 days isn't a whole lot. And sometimes we don't even have that much. That's, that's sort of an average taken from historical data. So, um, yeah, so, and I know it varies depending on where in the province you are. So some of you have a lot less than we do even. Um, I know up in Edmonton, they have a few more days. So it just depends. Um, some plants, um, in, the, in the case where, where plants where, where they take a long time to so you're going to you're going to want to start them from seed, but some of them you're not going to want to. So some plants you need to direct sow, um, like root veggies, that kind of thing. So those aren't going to be the ones that you're going to put in your school garden. You're going to want to do um, other plants that you can grow indoors and start indoors that are worthwhile doing that way. I'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, another thing, another reason why you're going to grow plants indoors is because you can control your climate a little bit better than you can outside. Uh, weather, you don't really have any say over that. It just kind of happens and you've got to deal with it. Um, but inside the classroom, you can control your, your lighting conditions. You can control how much water you're giving um, your plants. You can control the fertilizer. If you're using fertilizer, you can control all of those things. So you have a little bit more leeway than you do out in, in, in the outdoors. Um, so that's one, one another good reason to grow indoors. Um, and then a final reason why you're going to probably grow indoors in your classroom is it might fit with a lesson plan project that you've got. Um, you, there might be something in your curriculum where a plant, growing plants would be very useful to teach to the students. So those are some of the reasons. Um, 
I discussed a little bit about um, not not using not growing root vegetables in the indoor classroom um, because it just doesn't make any sense. They don't transplant well. They should be just direct sown. But plants that do actually grow good in in, in the uh, classroom include lettuce of all kinds. Um, you can there's so many different kinds and there's so many beautiful kinds so there's some that's speckled and there's some that's colored um, you know you've got reds and purples and all kinds of things so lettuce is brilliant it also grows really really quickly um, that's what's what a lot of these crops are ones that grow very very quickly and that are easy to bring to harvest um, so yeah those are great ones um, Asian greens so you're looking at you know mustard pak choy those kinds of things um, those aren't going to be ones that kids are going to be terribly familiar with, and maybe you're not even, um, but they're, they're kind of interesting and, and they grow quickly and they're, they're beautiful plants, a lot of them. Um, and you can stir fry them, you can add them to salads, they're awesome. And they're, they're, like I said, they're really beautiful plants, so easy to grow. Arugula is another one, again, another, another related to lettuce, that's a good one. Um, radishes, like I mentioned before, you can bring to root in a classroom garden. Um, peas and beans. A lot of people do grow them in classroom gardens. They're awesome. Um, I think beans are probably the best plant if you're going to teach children about how, a, how what, what the parts of a seed are um, because they've got these big, beautiful seeds and it's really, really easy to um, differentiate the different parts. Um, but um, they don't transplant particularly well. You can do, you can do it um, if you're careful. So um, definitely try them out. See, see what you can do. Peas also, you can grow as shoots. Um, so you can bring them to a certain size and then eat them if you want, if you don't want to transplant them out later on, um, it's up to you. So um, there's certain types of herbs that are good. Um, basil is often <laughs> considered a tricky plant to grow, um, but there's some, some types that are better than others um, and easier than others. And basil is an awesome plant to grow with kids because once it gets going, it grows quite quickly <laughs> and it's, um, it's tasty. So, I mean, you can, you can put it on with a bunch of different things, add it to a bunch of different foods. So kids like to eat it. Um, it's great in Italian food. So you're looking at pizzas, that kind of thing. Kids like the flavor. Um, so a little leaf basil, there's, there's one that has very small leaves. Um, it's a container basil. That's a great one to try. It grows really, really quickly and it doesn't, it's not fussy like some of the other ones. So, um, a lot of gardeners like to try um, squashes and that kind of thing, starting them indoors. I don't recommend it until just before spring, um, just before you're going to transplant it out. They grow really, really quickly. Um, so if you're looking at um, summer squashes like zucchini, patty pan squash, that kind of thing, um, they grow really, really quickly and they don't transplant particularly well. So, um, but they're also excellent ones because they have big seeds. Um, the plants grow really, really quickly. You can discuss the parts of the plant really, really well with those ones. It's easy to illustrate the different parts of the plant. Excellent, excellent examples. Um, sunflowers, again, brilliant to grow. Um, you can definitely, they grow like crazy. They're so fast once they get started. Big seeds again, um, they're great. Uh, they are a little bit trickier to transplant once they get to be a larger size um, because they have a really big tap root. Um, but when they're small, you can transplant them fairly well. So if you're going to grow them, kind of push that. Don't don't start them now. <laughs> Do them a little bit closer to spring. So um, and then a couple other plants, um, marigolds, nasturtiums. They're good flowering plants that you can you can grow in the classroom as well. Um, and then I mentioned sort of a little bit earlier microgreens. They're excellent. You're not going to transplant those out because you're only going to bring them to sort of a very small stage before you eat them. But they're great if you're doing indoor classroom gardening sort of in the wintertime or even now you could start a tray of them now. Um, they'd be ready, you know, depending on what you're planting, uh, radishes, kale, broccoli, something like that. They're ready to go in a few weeks. So, um, yeah, so there's a bunch of different types of crops that you can try. Um, and some of them you're going to want to transplant out into your garden, into containers or into your, your beds if you've got a, a, a school garden. Um, but yeah, they're all good ones. You can, some of these you can grow straight in the classroom until you've eaten them. So. <laughs> um, so educational concepts that you can link to growing in the classroom. Um, you're looking at things like math concepts. Um, for example, how many seeds should you put in a certain size container if the seeds need to be spaced? X number of millimeters apart. Your seed package is going to tell you the spacing. Um, so get kids to calculate that for you. Just take a look at the containers and, and see how many you can fit in. Um, think about it as, as in, in terms of your garden bed later on. Um, 
germination. What do plants need to germinate? What what um what elements do they need to germinate? What what is it that makes them makes them sprout? Um, dormancy. Uh, what is this? How do plants break it? Plants need to break dormancy to germinate. So um, for older students, you can talk about the different types of dormancy. Um, it's a little bit of a co more complicated uh, discussion, but it might be something that that you might be able to fit in. Um, that's exogenous and endogenous dormancy. So um, then you can talk about things like um, what you can do to get your seeds to break dormancy, things like scarification and stratification. Um, those again are higher concepts. So that would be for an older, older student, and those would be for older students, but it might be something that you might want to talk about. Um, parts of a seed and what do all of these things do? How do they act? What do they do for the seed? So you're looking at things like the embryo, the endosperm, um, the cotyledons, the radical, the plumule, all of the parts of the seed. And like I said before, take a bean seed apart and show the kids what it looks like and what all these parts are. It's, it's really fun and it's easy to learn from that. Um, scientific method, um, that's something that, um, you know, students are going to learn at a young age. So you're going to maybe try setting up an experiment with the plants. Um, you're adapting your variables, variables. Maybe you're adapting things like sunlight. How much sunlight are you giving them? Um, how much water are you giving them? That kind of thing. Um, you can talk about botanical nomenclature. What is a genus? What's a species? What's a variety? Again, that's going to be something you're going to tackle with older students. Um, how are seeds made? Um, propagation. Um, that's, you know, how did you get that seed that you're holding in your hand? Where did it come from? How did it happen? So those are all things. Um, depending on your age levels, um, I know that you're all, you know, teaching different types of age groups. So that, that'll be something that you'd have to tailor to your curriculum. But, um, so what do we have to do to prep for, for, for growing seeds in the classroom? Um, we need a few things for that. We need containers. Um, so I've got a couple here. I'm hoping that I can show you. Um, so I usually use seeding trays and cells. So that's, you're looking at a tray. Um, let's see if I can grab it here and show you. So you're looking at one of these guys here. Mine's a little dirty because I actually have been using it. <laughs> so yeah, so that's a seeding tray. And in that you're gonna put something like this, which is your cell pack. Um, these guys are great because you can put a bunch of different, like you can put one plant in each individual cell and then you can just pop them out afterwards. Um, I like the plastic ones um, because I can reuse them every year. I can just rinse them out. Um, you know, I do a little bit of a rubbing alcohol solution in there, clean them out really, really nicely, and then I can reuse them every year. Another option for those are the peat ones. Um, these are really great as well. You can just cut some holes in the bottom and you can actually plant these afterwards. Um, so you get your seeds going, you get your plants going, and then you can plant them if you're ready to go, like if it's that time of the year and you're ready to go. Um, or you can just transplant them up into bigger pots. It just depends on the plant and how far you're, you're at, what stage you're at by the time it's uh, time to transplant. Um, you can also sow in bigger containers. Um, a lot of people use red solo cups. That's a very big trend right now is to use them. They're, they're really inexpensive. You can buy them at the grocery store. You can buy them at the dollar store, whatever. These guys are good too. Um, these are really, really common nursery pots. Um, you probably have some if you've um, you know, bought plants at a garden center. Um, just clean them out really good and, and you can use these as well. Um, you can also buy these too. This one I bought, um, or even small pots. You can upcycle things too. You know, those little individual sized yogurt containers they can be upcycled into really, really great um, plant containers. So just make sure that all of these things have drainage. Um, drainage is absolutely critical. So make sure that they've got holes in the bottom. Um, make, make sure that there's a way for them to get water. Um, you don't wanna, you don't want the, the baby plants to be rotting. So make sure that there's, there's the, a movement of water through the soil. Um, so let's see. Uh, seeding, what else did I write? Oh, you can do uh, wicking, wicking setups. They're a lot more expensive. If for school garden or for school classroom garden, I don't know that I would go to that expense. Home gardener, sure. But the nice thing about those is that you don't have to water them as often. You can just water the, the tray and then the wicking mat brings the water up into the pot. So um, also I think too, with a school garden, you're, your students are going to want to water. You're not going to want to, you know, give them any <laughs> any additional help because they're going to they're going to need to learn how to do, how to do that job. So and when 
and to do it. So I think, yeah, so maybe forego that, but it is an option. Definitely. If you're going to be away or, you know, like um, over the weekends or something like that, if you find that you're not, you're not looking after the plants on a daily basis, try something like that because the seeds do need constant moisture. Um, you can't let your seedlings dry out or your seed dry out either, actually. So um, a lot of these trays, like mine came with a, a dome. Um, I don't have it on me right now, but um, it came with a plastic dome cover. Um, and you'll see that with a lot of propagation trays. That is a great idea. It helps keep the moisture in the soil um, when you just first seed it because you don't want them to dry out because seeds can actually die if they... Um, they don't get enough moisture. Like if they if they dry out and then get wet again and then dry out, they're not going to germinate. Um, so definitely um, put a little bit of a tray. Some people use plastic bags, whatever you want to do with that. The only problem with that is occasionally um, you're going to get a lot of condensation in there. You, you don't really want that to happen um, because it's not, not too much anyway, um, because then it can rot, mold, that kind of thing. Um, so take the dome off if you find that it's getting too wet inside. Um, yeah, definitely watch for that. Also, when the seeds germinate and the plants sprout, take the dome off. You don't need it anymore. So uh, that's, um, that's another thing to think about. Um, potting media. So um, usually when I'm writing and that kind of thing, I'm talking about making mixes for potting media. Um, we're quite often putting a bunch of things together and making mixes, but I think in this case, it is way simpler just to purchase them. Um, so get yourself either some um, uh, seed starting mix. It doesn't have soil in it. It's usually a peat-based um, mix or coir, um, and you can. It's usually got perlite, so maybe some compost in it, um, or you can use a potting soil, which does have soil in it, actual soil in it. Um, seed starting mix because it's peat-based or coir-based. It tends to dry out a little bit more, so you've got to keep up with your watering. The benefit with it, though, is that you don't end up usually getting soil-borne diseases with it. So you're not you don't usually dampen off like you do with um, with soil-based potting mixes. So it's up to you. I grow in potting mix actually all the time, and I don't usually have any troubles with anything. So um, you got to watch your watering. So yeah. It works really, really well, but either or, whatever you feel like doing. Both of these things are readily available in garden centers, um, big box stores, that kind of thing. So um, fertilizer, you don't need it at this stage. Um, whoever does the next discussion is probably going to talk to you a little bit about fertilizer. But when plants are still, uh, when seeds are sown, you don't need fertilizer. The seeds contain all the feed and the energy that the plant needs um, to get it going until at least a few sets of true leaves. So don't worry about it at this point. Um, it makes makes the job a lot easier. Um, I don't think anybody's going to be using grow lights or anything. If you are, let me know. I can just chat about that later on. Um, just put in the question or whatever. Um, I don't, I'm not sure how your setups are generally, but I, I wouldn't think that grow lights, you're probably going to use a window, I'm thinking. So make sure it's, a, um, if you can help it, you don't have a northern exposure. <laughs> um, get something that's, you know, put them in a, a place it's not northerly. Um, make sure that they're out of drafts. Um, if the window's really, really drafty, um, try to you know manage that in some way so that the seeds and the plants that are coming out of the seeds are not getting too cold. Um, so yeah, that definitely is, is something that you have to worry about. Um, southern exposures can sometimes be a little bit too hot. Um, so watch for signs once your seeds come up that the plants are getting scorched. Um, that will mean that they're maybe darkening on the one side, something like that. Um, prevent that from happening, just move them away from that exposure. Um, water, you need access to water. Um, you're gonna need to, to have a system for that. Um, and watering cans with narrow spouts work really well. Um, I've seen some people just uh, take the lid off of a pop can or a pop bottle and just poke a few holes in it, put it back on the pop bottle, fill the pop bottle with, or fill the pop bottle with water, put it back on, and then you can use that as a watering can. Pretty easy, um, easy for kids to manage. Um, other tools, um, probably things like scissors and, and trowels and that kind of thing. You don't really need a lot of tools for classroom gardening. Um, most of the stuff is going to be really, really hands-on. You're probably, the kids are probably going to put their hands in the dirt and put it in, in the pots that way. Um, you can use a trowel, that kind of thing. It might be messy, but it's, you don't need a lot of tools. So that's one really, really nice thing. You don't need to, there's no investment really with a lot of this. So. Um, so reading the seed packages, that's the next big step. Um, 
So you've got your seeds and you can really source those from anywhere. Um, we have a lot of really, really great Canadian seed companies. So, um, and uh, you know, if you want to order them from other places too, you can do that. But we have lots of really fantastic, even Alberta based seed companies. So yeah, I encourage everybody to look up those ones. Um, but um, yeah, your seed packages are gonna tell you all the basic stuff. So, I mean, you, you've all seen the seed package, so you know it's gonna say the name of the plant, all of that kind of thing. Um, there's going to be things on it that are going to be like uh, the information such as um, whether the seeds are organic. That just means that they were planted without the use of chemicals. The plants were, did not have any chemicals used on them. Um, it doesn't mean that you have to plant them organically, but you know, if you're gonna buy organic seed, yeah, I think it'd be worth it to plant it organically. It's, it's <laughs> you're, you're paying a little extra for organic seed. So um, heirloom seeds are ones that have a long history. Um, so usually that variety has been passed down from generation to generation. Um, so you're looking at, I think the cutoff right now is about 50 years. Um, some, some places state 100 years. So it just depends on what source you're looking at. Um, uh, hybrid seeds are of course um, varieties that we've bred, um, humans have bred. Um, OP, open pollinated. Um, those are plants that have been grown or that have been grown and pollinated by um, bees, other insects, butterflies, that kind of thing, um, ants, that kind of thing, uh, or the wind. Um, so your seed pack is also going to tell you when to plant. Um, this is important um, if you are starting your seeds indoors so that you're going to, with the plan that you're going to plant them out later in the spring, um, because you've got to count backwards. So there's a bunch of math involved here. Um, you've got to know your frost-free dates. Um, for your region. Um, you can gather all that information online. Um, I can actually put some links up on the uh, Alberta School Garden Group uh, Facebook page as well. That will give you some information about um, the frost-free dates for your region. Um, you'll need to know that because you're gonna have to count back. Um, so seed package is going to say, start this plant eight to 12 weeks before you're, you, before you're going to transplant out. So then you've got to calculate that back. So that's another actual exercise that you could get the students to do too is, um, you know, do the math on that, figure out, and then figure out how many days it's going to take to germinate. That's another piece of information that the seed package will tell you. Um, then you can go from there. Um, uh, what else we got? Hardiness zone, that doesn't really matter if you're planting annuals. So vegetables, if you're planting edible crops, um, unless they're perennial, you don't really need to worry about the hardiness zone. If you're planting perennials, we can talk about that um, in the questions or whatever, if you wish. Um, and let's see what else days to harvest that's an important one to know um you've got to calculate that into your um, mathematical equation there about when to plant as well um because it's going to be important to know whether that tomato plant that you're putting in is a 65 day or is it a 55 day um it does matter um so when you you got to plot that out um so that's all going to be part of the math um seed planting depth that's really important and the kids are going to need to know how deep to plant their seeds. Um, most of the time, small seeds, you don't really need to plant very deep at all. You, in fact, you don't want to because you could end up, um, the seeds could die before the plant actually makes it up through all those layers of soil and get up to the top of the, of the pot. So you need, to, um, you need to plant them at the appropriate depth and the seed package will tell you that. Um, with small seeds, sometimes you just need to sprinkle them on top um, and you don't even need to cover them. Seeds like lettuce, um, need light to germinate actually. So um, don't cover them with soil. Just make sure they have good contact with the soil and you're good to go. Um, and then spacing all of that kind of thing. That's those are all things that they're going to talk about on the seed package. Um, so those are really valuable. Um, get the students to, to take a look and learn from that. It's all really, really good information. So um, seed sowing. So I was just talking about small seeds. They can be really, really tricky for anyone to sow. <laughs> um, so you can use things like seed tape. You can make seed tape. Um, I'll put up a link on the Alberta School Garden Group for that too. There's some really awesome instructables on how to do that. Um, so uh, we can, that, that was a fun project to do, great craft project, uh, especially with small ones. Um, and uh, sowing, small, small, uh, sowing small seeds as well. You can use a toothpick, just dampen the tip of it and put it in and grab the seeds with it and then just put it on top of the soil. So another really, really good tip. Make sure that the seeds always have con good contact with the soil. That's the most important thing. Um, I covered depth already. Um, soil temperature is another thing to think about. 
and a costume garden, not so important. Most seeds will germinate between 15 and 21 degrees Celsius. Your classroom's probably going to be about 21 degrees Celsius or so, I don't know. Um, but yeah, so you're not gonna have to worry about that too, too much, so. Um, there are cool season crops that germinate at a lower temperature, but unless you're sowing them outside in your, in your classroom, it's not going to matter that much. Um, and finally, troubleshooting. There are a couple things that, that, that happen to seeds and happen to seedlings when they just come up. And I feel like I should, should let you know about them because they can be very disappointing <laughs> if it happens. Um, so damping off is probably the biggest one. Um, what happens with this, it's a fungal disease. Um, it, um, it causes the plants to sort of get watery and mushy, sort of right at the base of where the, the plant meets the soil. Um, it's a soil-based um, uh, borne disease, so it's, um, it will kill them immediately. Um, you wake up, you know, you get, get, go in and check on them in the morning when you get to your classroom and the seeds are all gone. Um, so, or those seedlings are all dead. So definitely something to prevent that is don't use a soil-based um, uh, potting mix. Use a seed starting one, a peat-based or a flower-based. Um, another thing is to um, make sure that there's lots of good air circulation in the room. Generally, classrooms are probably better than your house um, because they're bigger spaces, right? So they're, and they're gonna have movement with people moving around and the traffic and everything you're gonna have. And sometimes you might have a fan. If you've got a fan, um, like a ceiling fan, run it a few times a day, um, you know, just for a short amount of time, if it's toler you know, tolerable, if it's not too cool. Um, and the that's all you need. But I think I think damping off will probably not be as big of a problem in a classroom setting as it might be in home conditions. Um, we've got the heat and that kind of thing. Um, also, be careful when you're watering. Too much water will also um, instigate this kind of thing. Um, mold is another problem. Definitely, that is always ha that happens when you water too much. So students might need a little bit of coaching in that regard. So definitely watch for that. Um, and then also too dry is bad. Like I said before, if you let your seeds dry out, you can kill the seed, but if you let your seedlings dry out, you can also kill the seedlings. So, um, you know, sometimes it's not savable, but occasionally if they're not too far gone, like if the seedlings aren't too far gone, you might be able to soak the tray a little bit and um, let it drain and maybe they'll pop back up again. So there's a chance. If, if that happens, just start all over again and you should be okay. So just watch with the watering. That's always something to teach the students. So, and that's it, that covers my list. So <laughs> thank you for listening. That's, that's really, really great. So I hope I covered a few things that everyone's interested in and that they would like to know. So are there any questions? If you wanna type your questions into the chat, you can go ahead or you can feel free to unmute your microphone and join in and just ask your question that way. Um, Cheryl, we have one question in the chat. Can you share some watering tips? Oh, watering tips. Absolutely. Yes, I can. Um, so um, basically, like I said, you have to strike a balance. So um, if you're using this tray setup where you've got the bottom tray and you've got your little cells like these guys in the tray, you can actually water in the tray. Um, these cells all have drainage at the bottom of them. They've got holes cut in. The peat ones, they don't have holes, but people absorb the water um, so you can actually water in the tray itself you don't actually have to water with like water the plants at the base of the plants you can water in the tray then the water will will go through the soil percolate through the soil and it'll water um, the plants it's actually kind of a nicer way of doing it it's more even um, you tend not to overwater as much because the soil will only take up as much as it can because there's a water holding capacity. Um, so it will only take up as much as it possibly can. It's not, it's not going to usually take up too, too much. So that's, that's an option. Um, and you can, you can water from the base. Don't sprinkle the water over top of the little plants. Um, you don't want the leaves or anything to get wet if possible. So try to be careful to water right at the soil level. Um, it, it does help prevent things like, like damping off. Um, and any other kind of fungal problem. So yeah, definitely that's a good option. You're gonna wanna water, I mean, I find with mine at home, I almost have to water every day. I think pretty much um, I've got them under the grow lights. And I mean, if you've got them under in a, in a sunny area, it's going to be the same thing. So I'm looking at watering every day. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're on that. Um, that's, that's something. And it, once the plants grow larger, you're going to need to like, and if they start outgrowing their cells, outgrowing their pots, 
they're going to need, they're going to get drier faster. So you're going to A, need to transplant them, um, which I think they're covering in the next course, but um, they, they will dry faster. So you're going to need to keep up with the watering. So in some cases, you might be watering more than, more than once a year. So, so yeah, um, I think that's everything I'm trying to think. Um, you don't have to anymore with water. Um, a lot of people have been... Um, uh, letting it sit for 24 hours. You don't necessarily have to do that with tap water anymore. They've kind of done a lot of research on that and they found that it doesn't really make any huge difference with the, chlor the amount of chlorine in the water. So you can just run water right out of the tap. It's not gonna hurt the, to hurt the plants. So that's, that's a great thing too. So you don't have to wait. <laughs> okay, and then next question, when should grow lights be considered? Oh, okay. Definitely, if you don't have sufficient light in in your classroom, um, I, it depends on how your building is designed. I know that there's going to be a lot of circumstances where you're not going to have really, really great light. Um, or if we have like stretches of weather or whatever, where you don't, you do, or you're in a shaded like a canopy, like an awning or something is over top, you're not going to have a good, good light. Like you've got a building, another building next door or something like that. You're not going to have great light. Um, those are definitely times when you're going to want to use a grow light um, because the plants need a lot of light. Um, you're looking at like I run my grow lights about 14 hours a day. Um, 16 hours is good too. So 14 to 16 hours is what you're looking at. So, and that's just because I don't have them. I don't have great windows here. I have north facing. I don't have sufficient light. So, um, yeah, so you do need really good light. Um, otherwise, the seedlings are going to stretch. Um, that, that means they're going to get really, really lanky and long. They might flop over. It's going to be very disappointing. <laughs> they're not going to necessarily be strong enough to be able to transplant out in the garden later on. Um, they might die, that kind of thing. So definitely light is, a, it's, in, it's crucial to have sufficient light. Um, but, but if your classroom does have, like at this time of year, the light is changing, right? Um, so you're getting longer days, um, you're getting more light. Um, so yeah, now is, is the time when you're going to start seeing um, more success with your, your seedlings and that kind of thing. If you're growing earlier in the season, so, so say you're doing microgreens in December, um, in your classroom garden, you might not have as much success because you're not going to have a lot of light coming in through the window. So in that case, you might want to have grow lights. So yeah, there are um, tons of different grow light setups available. Um, you can get everything from those little halogen, they're called halos, they look like a little angel's halo, um, but you just plug in. You can get, um, they're called sunblast, there's a fluorescence. You can get LEDs, which are quite a bit more expensive, but they're um, very energy efficient. There's all kinds of different things. Um, they come in kits so that you've got kind of a tray underneath. The sky's the limit. Um, of course, the price point is also the limit. But yeah, so um, yeah, absolutely. Um, if you don't have sufficient light, I would recommend grow lights for sure. Okay, and we have another question in the chat about doing lettuces in the classroom. Can we transplant into an outdoor garden or is that just for indoors? Um, you can definitely, lettuce will transplant. It can be a little bit tricky, <laughs> um, but if you get the whole, like if you, um, if you have it in a container where you can get that whole root ball, yeah, lettuce transplant's fine. Um, it doesn't have a tap root. Um, so yeah, it just kind of, yeah, you, as long as you get as much of that root ball as possible when you go to transplant it, you can absolutely do that. You can um, grow it, start it inside. Um, and then put it outside later on. Absolutely not a problem there. You can put it in another big container um, or you can put it out in your garden bed, whatever. Yeah, absolutely. I have another question for you here. Um, you talked about creating a dome on your trays when you plant your seeds. Are there simple household items you can use to create that dome and does it need to have ventilation? For sure. Um, no, it doesn't need to have ventilation. Um, you don't need to, um, because you're only using it for an extremely short amount of time. Um, so you just, um, you're basically plunking it on and leaving it um, until the seeds germinate. So basically the only reason you're using the dome is to maintain the moisture level in the soil. Um, you're not really using it for any other purpose. You're not using it once the plants start growing. You're not using it for anything else. It's just to keep those moisture levels. So um, absolutely, you know what? Um, I have used shower caps that you buy at the dollar store. <laughs> um, they work beautifully because they're elasticized. You just plunk them over top of you. Like if you're using small containers, just plunk them over 
top and then you can just lift them up. It's so easy to water everything. Those are fabulous. Um, plastic bags work really, really well. Like if you've got a Ziploc baggie in your container, you just pop it over top of your container. If your container fits inside the Ziploc baggie, you can do that. You don't, you can either choose to close it or not. I am, um, I usually close them, but I mean, it's up to you. Um, uh, what else works? Um, I've used, um, plastic from um, saran wrap. That's what I was going for, like the, the, the kitchen plastic. Um, you can use that if you want, whatever, those kinds of things. They're all quite inexpensive and, and they're things that you would have around the house. Um, the reason why a lot of these trays use those, those beautiful domes is because they fit perfectly. Um, they're not very expensive either, so um, they're really, really good. If you're doing a whole series of um, cells, it's really, really nice to have a nice dome to put over top. So yeah, 